ready to start. OK, well, it's 11 o'clock, so good morning, everyone. I'm Lou Cerny, and I'm a vice president with Southern Supply Chain Consultants. And it's my pleasure to welcome you and our speakers to our fourth annual educational series. Uh, this is the first of three sessions that we will be presenting during 2024. And so we just ask that you please take a look for invitations for our next two sessions, which will be covering automation and cybersecurity. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on our site. Today we're presenting uh, decoding the value of JAT GTP in large language models or LMS, LLMSs for supply chain. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Guy Curtin. And Guy is a Vice President of Industry and Global Alliances at Texas. And he'll be joined a little bit later on in the presentation by Ryan Praler, who's a client executive with SEDLAC. We do ask that if you have any questions uh, associated with the presentation, that you use a chat function to be able to uh, get those questions in front of our, our panel, and uh, we'll be happy to address as many of those as we possibly can. So as we look at the agenda for today, uh, you know, we're going to do a little bit of an overview of AI and kind of level set with, with you, our participants. We'll then have a couple of tracks for discussion. One is kind of the supply chain use cases and then characteristics of successful AI ventures. And again, we'll have uh, sufficient time at the end of the presentations to be able to address questions that are uh, issued to us through the chat function. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Guy and uh, continue on with the session. Thank you, Lou. Really appreciate it. And again, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to this uh, to talk a little bit more about what is, of course, one of the hottest topics we're seeing out there. But <clears throat> let's do a little level setting first. And I put this date up. Why? Because, well, 1956 and a couple of really interesting things happened uh, this this in this year. And of course, this was almost 70 years ago. There was a perfect game pitched in the World Series by Larson of the New York Yankees, something that has never happened since then uh, and really was really obviously one of the biggest landmark events in, in, in modern baseball. The movie The Ten Commandments came out and uh, Easter was just a few weeks ago, so I actually was able to watch it again on television and, and it was a, a fantastic watch uh, to see just how, how much acting in movies have changed over time. And The Ten Commandments, of course, with Charlton Heston and others, uh, fact, quick trivia, it actually was nominated for a number of Oscars, but really only won one minor Oscar, did not win Best Picture or any of that. And when you look back on it, it's kind of surprising. But again, 1956, Ten Commandments, one of the best movies that came out. Politically, uh, the Hungarians rose up against the Soviet Union. This is before, during the Cold War, when there was the Eastern Bloc. Uh, it was unfortunately crushed very violently by, by Russia, who sent in tanks into places like Budapest and other parts of, of Hungary. But in 1956, this was still the political atmosphere we were living in. And finally, this, this, this guy by the name of Elvis Presley appeared for the first time on The Ed Sullivan Show. And by many accounts, this was really the launch of his career to stardom. So this little known, this little known singer, rock and roll singer, Elvis Presley, uh, makes his appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. So these are just some of the, the big events that happened you know, almost 70 years ago in 1956. But of course, there's something else that happened that year over the summer. A number of mathematicians and scientists all decided to converge on a little town in New Hampshire, Hanover, where Dartmouth College is. And they actually coined a certain phrase called artificial intelligence. So in 1956, the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on artificial intelligence, as you can see from this plaque that you can see if you ever go up to Dartmouth, it's the first use of the term artificial intelligence. Now, Alan Turing, before 1956, had already started to talk about this notion of, wasn't coined yet, but of machines being able to do what humans could do, about machines being able to learn, uh, et cetera. Now, why did I bring this up? I bring this up for one purpose and one purpose only, is to say that AI, artificial intelligence, is not a new thing. It is not something that just appeared the past three, four, five years. This has been around and has been studied and looked at for obviously almost 70 years now. So let's think a little bit more. Let's talk about what is AI. And I think it's always important to level set. 
So I took this, you know, off the internet uh, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, but I think it's a quick and easy definition of AI, and I think it's important to level set on what AI truly means. So let's read this together. Artificial intelligence, AI, is the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Now, joking aside, we could argue what does the term intelligent mean, because that has a whole a host of definitions itself, but really it's this basic notion of, of a digital computer or robot to be able to do things that, that are typically associated with humans. So when we think about AI, obviously AI today continues to be hot and there's a good reason for it. And there's a lot of investment that's been going on. If you look at what Gartner looked, put out there uh, recently, the growth of the AI software forecast and growth in millions of dollars is obviously trending up, uh, getting well over or getting over 20% growth and will continue to the trend line, will continue to push in that direction. So of course, it is a hot area. It is something that we are all looking for. It is something that is on top of everyone's mind. And when we think about where AI and AI software is being invested and forecasted, this is also interesting to look at. And the reason being is the following. The arrow here I pointed to is supply chain. And supply chain falls about, I think, ninth in this list from the top. And one of the themes I want us to think about when we think about AI and investment is the following. If we look at the top categories here that are being invested in, digital government services, finance, legal, banking, human capital, think about that for a second. Why are these the ones that are being heavily invested in? And I'll give you my answer. It's because a lot of these have a controlled data set. They have a clean data set. They are looking at functions that fall within the parameters of the four walls of a business. Right, when I think of, yes, banking, we have customers and all this, but banking, you're really thinking about what am I doing in terms of the funds in my bank, what's going on in markets? And yes, of course, you could say there are external factors, absolutely. But finance, human capital management, right? These are all things that really are falling within the four walls of your business. When it comes down to supply chain, the big challenge of supply chain is the following, your data sources. Supply chain, as we all know, is a massive network. It is a massive, disparate, messy, dirty network from everything from sourcing to distribution to manufacturing to storage to selling to returns, all this. And all these are coming with different forms of data at different paces, et cetera. So I want you to keep that in mind as we walk through this, that this idea of clean data and this idea of controlled data is paramount to being able to do some AI. But if we look even deeper into some of these numbers, and this is from McKinsey, most companies, most organizations, at least one business unit within their function is looking to adopt AI. And this is around 50% uh, of, of those surveyed. And if I go back to the slide before this, I would argue that if we dove in deeper into these numbers, a lot of these organizations, the business unit for the most part, are going to be business units that have, again, that clean data they can start applying some AI to. So let's level set a bit. You know, as Lou pointed out in the agenda, we want to level set a little bit more about what really is going on in the space of AI and what does it really mean for you? What I would argue is, as I showed you, right, back in Hanover, back in the 50s, right, we, we coined the term AI. But why is AI for the past, I would say, five, six, maybe 10 years really taken off here in business? And I would argue there are three big pillars to this phenomenon. A is around data creation. Now, I did some research on this the other day, and I'm sure you've all heard and seen this, but the amount of data that is being created is mind boggling. In 2000 or 2025, there's predicted to be 175 zettabytes of data. Now, a zettabyte, one zettabyte is 1,000 bytes to the seventh power, which means there are 21 zeros in that number. I don't know about you, but I, I really cannot put my head wrapped around that. I just know it's a lot of data. And if you look at, if you think about this too, by 2030, 90% of the population older than six years old will be online. Now, why is that important? Because all those people are creating more data. Right, More and more data is being fed into this machine. Now, we can have a discussion and debate. How clean is that data? How relevant is it? Of course. But just the sheer volume of data is mind-boggling. And we'll get to why this is important in a second. But the second, of course, of all that data, data creation is data storage. Right, We need to be able to hold and maintain all this data. What's interesting is if you look back 
at 1956, I, I was talking a lot about the 50s right now, but 1956, I'm just reading this. So a 2,000 pound unit for data storage cost about $35,000 a year to maintain, and it had five megabits of data. Today, I just went on Amazon yesterday, and for $29.99, that's $29, let's say $30, and if you're Amazon Prime, you get you know two-day shipping, you can get a one terabyte thumb drive. So think about that in about 70 years. We've gone from a 2,000 pound, five megabit machine to now a $30 terabyte thumb drive I can order on Amazon. So now we also have the ability to store all this data. And finally, this is just as important, or, or one of the three legs of this, this stool is the computation power. And if you look at computation power today, right, we, I'm gonna go back to the 50s again, if, or sorry, the 60s. If you go back to 1969, NASA put man on the moon, uh, we put man on the moon with the computation power of less than your smartphone you're probably carrying around with you right now, the equivalent of two Nintendo game boxes together in terms of computation power. So think about that. The computation power, of course, has gone through the roof. What I've read somewhere is that there is a one trillion fold increase in computation power in the past 70 years. One trillion growth of computation power. So we take all these three pieces of the stool, the data creation, the ability to store the data and to access it. That's the other part, right? We can store and we can access it. And the third part is around the ability to provide computation power, to do something with that data. Those three legs of the stool, if you will, is what has really created AI or made AI become such a hot topic because now we can, we can start realizing the dreams that those folks that met in Hanover, New Hampshire in the late 50s we're starting to think about, right? We're able to now reach out and do certain things that we never thought possible because now we have the tools and the data and the access that we never imagined we could have before. And this is around us already, right? We know this. So I'm sure many of you watch Netflix. I certainly do. I mean, I, I will date myself. I go back to Netflix when I was still uh, putting in a queue, the, the DVDs I wanted, and they'd send it to me. But we all have heard stories, if not, uh, Netflix, you know, uses, they have tremendous amount of data. They have a tremendous, truly large language model of data that they control, that they can harness. And what they've done is they've been able to scrape that data to then create their own content, to be able to understand what are people looking at? What are some of the micro trends they can glean out of this data? How can they look at this in a way that they can turn around shows much quicker than the old fashioned way uh, of Hollywood studios? How do they always bubble up certain movies to us? Why? Because they're doing a lot of scraping of the data, a lot of what we would consider maybe a large language model of trying to figure out everything that's out there that's in a controlled environment that they can then bubble up to us and provide to us. And of course, AI powered devices go beyond Netflix, right? We see these all around. Our personal assistants that we have, many of us have in our homes with Amazon or Google or others. We have the digital nests, right? The thermometers. These things are all trying to collect a tremendous amount of data and then apply some kind of AI type algorithm to it to then better determine how to service. Obviously, cars like Tesla were trying to become driverless. That is all obviously in real time an AI engine trying to calculate what is going around, not only around the car, but anticipating what might be happening what's happening in front of the car based on other data it's pulling, what's happened behind the car to the sides, look at patterns such as weather, et cetera. So we're having this. And, and my favorite one, which I saw, of course, also on Amazon, is you could buy this AI-powered bird feeder, which with, with its camera will be able to identify what kind of birds are coming to your bird feeder, when, what kind of seed are they eating, so that you can do a better job feeding the birds that are coming to your bird feeder. But again, when we think about AI, we must realize that this is already around us. It's been around us really since the 1950s, but we're seeing it coming into fruition even more and more into consumer digestible products as the ones I just showed. So let's take another step and look, because I'm sure we've heard of all this, AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, cognitive, you know, generative AI, all these terms that get thrown around a little bit too loosely. So if we look at the first term, artificial intelligence, right? This is sort of the grandfather of the terms. And as I mentioned, this was coined in 1956. Some would argue as Mr. McCarthy, he was part of that group who first coined it. 
right? But as I defined earlier, it's really the ability of a machine or a digital computer to act like a human. If we go down one level, right, machine learning, and we've heard this a lot, but machine learning is the field of study of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So now we're taking one step away where the human is sort of setting parameters, but the machine itself is learning. It's able to understand patterns and make better use of them and, and be able to basically do things that we did not have to program it to do. And then finally now, which is I think the most modern, the hottest topic, if you will, at some level is this notion of deep learning. And from this definition, right, is deep learning is an algorithm which has no theoretical limitations of what it can learn. The more data you give and the more computational time you provide, the better it is. Now, a key term here for everyone to, to, to hone in on, though, is theoretical limitations. Right? Again, reason why I want to bring this up is that sometimes we get sort of bamboozled, if you will, by CEOs standing on stage talking about generative AI or about articles about how AI is doing this and that. But let's let's ask the questions. Let's not be afraid to ask the questions about what does that really mean? Do you even understand where this is going to go? Because a lot might not themselves. But again, I want us to keep this in context, right? There are different degrees within this world, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, cognitive AI, et cetera. And if you look at generative AI, which is one of these hot topics around sort of deep learning, is that there is a trend as more and more are starting to invest in this space. So this is again from Gartner. Uh, a question about is your organization currently employing generative AI beyond, beyond chat GPT for any specific applications? And only 12% said yes extensively. I think 48% is is where we think, uh, you know, a lot of people are probably just using chat GPT for different functions within their business. And then as you can see, there's another about 40% that really have not started to look at it yet. So, you know, think about it, I would say as a 50-50 split. Um, and again, not surprising that it's probably a lot of it's still limited to ChatGPT or a little bit beyond that. And where are these companies focusing? And this, again, I think is, is no surprise, especially for us in the supply chain space. So the question is, what specific areas do you anticipate generative AI will have the most substantial impact within your organization this year? First one, no surprise, <clears throat> improving efficiency in business process. Think about this for a second, right? Business process, a lot of times it's functions, it's business functions that you do over and over again. It's the ability to do things in a uh, efficient manner. So if you're looking at things like generative AI and deep machine learning, what the machine is very good at is to pick up on inefficiencies and patterns that we as humans just don't have the ability to see. Whether it's there's just too much data, we can't draw the correlation, um, we get tired and things of that nature. So from that perspective, this is a very interesting use case because yes, it does make sense to leverage some of these tools to become more efficient in your business. And if you look as you go down and prove customer experience, again, same thing in some degree, right? There's process that you can look at. Data-driven decision-making, again, it's a lot about process and using the data. Having said that, at the end, we are also all consumers, no matter what our day job is. So part of this is, is important because as consumers, and why do I bring this up? Because as consumers, our attitudes will always carry over into our work world. What I mean by that is when we, now I know we don't all show up to an office on Monday morning, but let's assume we all did and, and not just roll out of bed and log onto our computers. When we show up to work on Monday morning, our expectations of, of technology does not change. Think about this, 10, 15 years ago, you would be, or once when, when you started using Amazon, you would say, hey, when I wanna order something, I'm used to the Amazon experience, but when I go to the office and I procure uh, you know, uh, coffee and uh, toilet paper for my office, I'm used to the green screen, or if I book travel, I'm used to the green screen. Well, not anymore. We as consumers now expect how we interact with technology on the consumer side, to be the same as on the business side. So when we when I look at this information about how as consumers, we are looking at artificial intelligence, I think it's important to keep this in perspective because we're gonna start having, or we should have that same type of attitude when it comes to our work usage of AI. So the question here from, on, from Forbes was, the types of content where consumers are concerned with artificial intelligence being used and concerned at 70% around product descriptions, product reviews, right, chatbots, job applications, right? All of these are all at least over 55%.
Now, what that tells me when I read this is that we have, as consumers, a healthy level of skepticism towards what AI can do. What are the limitations? Where can I trust it and where can I not? And I think this is something that we must all keep in mind in our day jobs because it is very important that we keep this, this sort of grounding as well as in our personal lives when it comes to AI, but also in our day jobs. So let's look at supply chains and AI, right? Because at the end of the day, as you saw in the earlier slides, supply chains and AI, it's not the top of the list, but it's, you know, it's the top, top half of the list of where people are investing. And I do think there's a lot of promise in it, but there's also a lot of irrational exuberance in it. And again, a lot of it does come at times from supply chain service vendors who want to tell you they're doing all this AI stuff, but is there really a lot of meat behind on that bone? And if we look at AI and supply chain, this part I do think is very interesting. And this again is looking at whether it's going to be a cost decrease or revenue increase from AI usage. So that means is it going to reduce my cost and obviously be, you know, grow more efficiencies or am I going to find more markets to sell into? And supply chain management, which I think is very promising, is the is the one area of all these, whether it's manufacturing, HR, marketing, et cetera, where it's almost an even 50-50 split. And I do think that's very promising from this perspective. As supply chain professionals, we're starting to recognize that AI will be able to help us do many things from both the capturing of markets, but also the increasing efficiencies on the backside of our supply chains. And I do think that's very promising. And that means that there are a lot of use cases, which I know we're gonna to get to in a little bit, that you can start focusing on to say, is this use case applicable to leverage some type of AI machine, AI tool, to either A, capture more market, or B, grow more efficiencies. And if we think of the abundance of use cases, right, in, in supply chain, we take the score model. And what I want us to think about as well is as we go dive in deeper into each part of our supply chain, each part of the score model, there are gonna be specific use cases within each that are more applicable potentially to an AI type tool, while others might not be. And one of the things I've been thinking about, and, and I will float this out there as, as one of my theories on this, is if you start looking at some of the use cases we're seeing today with supply chain and AI. So take, for example, in planning, right? There's a lot of companies using, uh, like CPG companies, using more and more data to be more efficient about planning, be more efficient about when they sunset products, right? To look at the data. Now, I could argue we've been doing that forever. Now, back to my earlier slides, we just have more data. We have more horsepower. We have more computation power to be smarter about this. Ordering, of course, one of the things, ordering and sourcing, if you put those together, it's be smarter about the sourcing partners you work with, about ordering inventory, when to do it. But what's interesting is a lot of the really interesting use cases on AI that are much more applicable today or, or in reality are around the transform manufacturer fulfill sections. And the reason I believe that is, is again, these are within our supply chain, are very, their supply chain execution. So there's much more control of the data, much more control of what's happening within the four walls. So for example, in transform, in manufacturing, there's a really interesting use case with BMW that is using a lot of AI and um, intelligent um, vision control to do uh, quality control throughout the whole process of putting together a BMW. And many of you might know that BMW is, is legendary for the ability to customize their cars, where I believe there's a plant, uh, one of the plants here in the United States, where they could literally run three shifts a day, full bore, all year, and they'll never manufacture the same car twice, right? That isn't how many options there are. But now they're leveraging AI and this vision technology to ensure quality control throughout the whole process. And if you watch, there's a great video online to see it, and it's really fascinating how it also pulls into account FTEs, they're going to use their mobile phones to use their cameras to then tie into the cameras built into the factory uh, and then to use AI to better understand what's happening along the whole process. And of course, if we look at Fulfill, we see the rise of warehouse automation. We see the rise of robotics, right, uh, on how we're using AI and robotics and all kinds of, of new technologies to be much smarter in the warehouse. If we look at Fulfill outside the warehouse, right, if we look at distribution, Companies like 3PLs like DHL are using a thing called Green Plan, which is again using a lot of data that they already have, historical data, 
but pulling in other data sources, obviously things as we know, like weather, traffic patterns, holidays, et cetera, to better route their trucks in real time. But again, it's using a lot of control data, meaning data that they have themselves, that it's probably been cleaned, been put in the format they need, and putting in other data sources that they know they can pull in on a consistent basis, like weather patterns. So when we think about these use cases, think about that perspective, right? Is the data source you're pulling from something that you can trust, that is clean, that is, has enough information for you to employ some of these AI tools to? And of course, you know, this is always, I think, we think about AI, uh, this little cartoon, right? The decisions, his decisions aren't any better than yours, but they're way faster. At the end of the day, at some level, you know, some of the things when we talk about AI, the most powerful AI engine we still have uh, is the one sitting between your ears. So what I always tell people when we think about AI is use that one first before you just blindly use an AI tool that someone has told you to. So with that level set, I'd love to turn over and Ryan to talk a little bit more about some of the supply chain use cases and of course the characteristics of successful AI ventures. Thanks, Guy. Look forward to uh, these uh, discussion tracks and uh, talking through them with you. I have a I have a zettabyte of information that's flowing through my head after <laughs> your uh, after your presentation. So that was that was great, and I think you know the the audience is uh, going to be very appreciative of the information you shared. There's there's just there's so much of a buzz around AI. So I think you know level setting um, all the folks on. You know what really makes sense for their business is is what this webinar is all about, and what you know what Sedlac and Texas really represent as organizations. So, you know, we're excited uh, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, Guy and I, to talk about supply chain use cases. Um, we have three examples um, there that are that are similar, um, but also very different in how they interact within logistics and supply chain. And then we're going to talk about what are the characteristics of successful AI ventures, and does this really make sense? You know, if um, if you're a, um, so a potential user of AI and you're challenged for, by your organization to, to locate AI, does this really make sense? So we're gonna talk through some of the things that are, uh, you know, kind of red flags that it, it may not be a great fit and, and what, what means it is, um, is the right fit. Uh, so, so look forward to, to talking through. So the, the three supply chain use cases will be, um, the first one, predictive analytics for demand forecasting. The second one will be automation in warehouses. There's been a ton of automation, but how is AI uh, fitting into that automation? And then autonomous vehicles, both in logistics and um, in, in general purpose. So uh, first with predictive analytics uh, for demand forecasting, uh, what predictive analytics is, just to kind of define that, is um, leveraging historical and current data to make predictions about the future. And then uh, demand forecasting detects patterns uh, to anticipate customer demand and business opportunities. So retailers um, really have been, you know, kind of all over using predictive predictive analytics to to anticipate what customers will buy. Um, so you know, I think of um, I think of uh, Amazon. Um, you know, when I when I search for a uh, a golf shirt. Um, and then they uh, they suggest that I uh, should buy some golf shoes, some golf shorts, and some golf balls. Um, so they're hyper they're hyper personalizing my experience. Um, I am somewhat concerned um, that they know somehow how many golf balls I'm losing, <laughs> but th that just can't be the case, could it, Guy? No, I think they're they're just um, you know they they just assume you'll be playing so much golf that you need that many golf balls. It's certainly not. Uh, uh, pulling your handicap score or, you know, uh, looking at some cameras from the golf courses and and and, <laughs> and seeing Ryan storming off, uh, breaking his golf clubs, because that's certainly not the case. Possible, though, right? Um, and also, uh, manufacturers leveraging predictive demand forecasting to streamline their production scheduling and raw, raw materials purchasing. That's one of the things that, that we're going to notice as we talk through these things is more interconnection within the flow of a business versus looking at you know pieces and segments of a business. So more interconnectivity to streamline uh, business operations. So that's really the first uh, first of the supply chain use cases is focused on you know kind of the predictive analytics and and demand forecasting. Yeah, and and Ryan, you know I think this is a a great discussion point too from this perspective because I would also 
caution, you know, when it comes to uh, some of the demand forecasting side, and and this goes back to you know century old issues with demand forecasting is we're always chasing that perfect forecast, and I think we all know in supply chain that 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 is um, that's the holy grail, and you know we'll probably never find it. It's it's you know it's lost. The Knights Templar protecting it. We're never going to get to it, but we're always trying to push. Can we get you know above seventy percent, eighty percent, nine, whatever that num that magic number may be? And I do think to your point, you know, like your, your great example with Amazon, right? The ability to anticipate, and, and I've seen this before. You know, if, if if I go before Amazon, if I you know story about Best Buy when Best Buy had you know their first their one of their first websites, I remember speaking to them. This is a long time ago, but they were doing sort of a rudimentary format of this in terms of AI, which was they would scrape a bunch of data from their competitors. So. Uh, Best Buy had on their website, of course, they're selling, this is DVDs, DVD players. They were selling DVD players from Sony, from Panasonic, um, you know, from Sanyo, from all these different brands. And what Best Buy figured is, wait a second, we have this controlled environment where we have all this data from our consumers coming in that we can then scrape. So I can see that, hey, this Sony DVD player gets one out of five stars, and here's all the negatives. So we're not going to do that. Here's a Panasonic DVD that gets five stars with 100 reviews, and we're going to scrape that and say, well, what are the consumers like? So then they could go out and literally buy their own, they could manufacture their own uh, DVD player and basically private label it and take the best of the best and, the, and leave out the worst. And what happened was a lot of the the, the players or the, the Sony said, wait a minute, like you're, you're li- learning off of our backs. But I think that's exactly to your point, this notion of being more predictive and, and using the data. But again, the Amazon example, the Best Buy example, is that data is protected, so to speak. It's controlled within their website, right? It's their right. data. I think the challenge, Ryan, that, that we're seeing is now if you're doing this outside, and you're tr- meaning outside of your four walls, because supply chains are naturally outside the four walls, is how do we ensure that the data we're getting, that the ability to look and anticipate demand patterns are clean, are true, right? So, you know, maybe maybe one day uh, I'm, I'm trying to scrape uh, the Ryan Golf data and you're having a bad round and I'm like, oh, he's terrible. I'm going to ship him, you know, 200 more golf balls and this. But what we didn't realize is that one day it was, you know, the weather was terrible or you were having an off day or, you know, you, you, you went out to the Texas conference the night before and had a great night and, and were a little <laughs> bit hungover and that you're really, you know, a two handicap. So what am I doing here? So I think that's, that's, something that we have to be hyper conscious of when it comes to this because i i do think one of this this particular use case i feel like there's a lot of noise that we're we meaning sellers of ai are trying to tell the market that hey remember those problems you had in terms of doing better predictive analytics remember those problems you had of trying to get your planning up to 75% well now ai is going to solve it and I think that's a disservice, right? Because I believe that at the end of the day, it's just another tool. And the problem about demand forecasting is we're trying to forecast the future based on the past. Right. And that's that's that until I and until someone proves to me that that is a surefire way of predicting the future. I don't know. I, I think it's still you know the data we use is still it's still historic data. It's still it's still, it's still stale, if you will. Yeah, agreed. And 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 data is always power, but uh, you know, or until we can look into the future, it's it's going to always be a challenge. And, and I think that's the part with demand forecasting that I I would caution everyone. I think there's a lot of promise to use smarter AI, meaning, and I think if we peel the onion back, it's really to be smarter with the data we're pulling to be able to make or to have a another um, tool to give me another signal that at the end of the day, I still think planners need to use their most powerful AI engine, the one between their ears, to then make better decisions. And now, yes, there's some aspects, I think, from a demand forecasting that you could potentially leave to the machine. But again, I caution everyone to say, like, just, and again, some might say I'm just being an old curmudgeon, but I will say, you know, I we've seen this, especially in the financial markets, where we rely too much on the data and the machine telling us what to do, and we don't think. Yeah. 
right? We're afraid. We're afraid to use. Again, to your point, that most powerful engine that's right here. That's right there. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And uh, let's move on to inside the warehouse and talk a little bit about um, warehouse automation. So I think from a, a machine learning perspective, you know, dynamic slotting is 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 so important. You know, leveraging that data. Uh, to ensure that your most used products are are closest to the picking and shipping areas. And again, dynamic slotting isn't something that's new, but leveraging the power of the information that's available and and those tools um, to dynamically slot, you know, using the, the most available and best tools. Same thing with optimizing travel distances and paths in the warehouse. I mean, this can really boost productivity um, cut down on um, the need for surge labor um, during very busy times. So it's important to, um, again, these are not things that are new, but to leverage the best tools that are available to optimize these very important areas of warehouse management. No, I think, Ryan, you're spot on. And I think this, I, and I, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to mention it again. And if, if, I yeah, sound like a broken record. That's good because that this is, I think, really important to to think about is like these two use cases you provided in terms of machine learning within the warehouse. I I would ask again rhetorically, what's the big, what's the big variable here? It's the data is being controlled, if you will, by that warehouse. Meaning, right, the data is either in a WMS system or an ERP or what have you, but the data is. It, it, you know that that warehouse is able to dictate how that data is being processed, used, cleansed, and all this, and that means that it makes it a very good use case to apply AI in whatever form that is. To to your point, try to improve. I'm not going to say optimize because I know you know we we always throw that term around, but I would say improve these processes, right? Dynamic slotting, travel distances, picking distances, etc. Because again, we we know like we we know all the variables, we know the data, we know our labor, we know our FTE, we know their we, we know if we have a good LMS system, we might go down their characteristics. Like, hey, you know, John walks faster, uh, but Mary's a better picker. So how do we then you know marry that up with what we're doing in terms of travel distances, et cetera? So I do think to your point, like the ability to then leverage AI, machine learning, to dive in deeper into that data and to potentially pick up operationally nuances that you and I, even though we have a very powerful AI engine, we just can't see that pattern as well as a machine can. But then how do we take that data as a warehouse operator and say, how do I apply it, right? How do I, how do I then put into use? Because one thing I will say that the machine still can't do is identify or anticipate the change management repercussions. And that's something else to keep in mind, right? At the end of the day, I'm going to sound corny when I say this. It's still about the humans, right? The humans are yep. still in there. It's still human labor. And human labor, unlike robots, we've got families. We've got, you know, we've got birthdays to go to. We've got soccer games we have to go to. We've got to go out with our friends. We've got to go out on a date. We've got parents we got to take care of. Uh, we have to take care of a kid, right? There's all host of things that are going to come into play. And then there's also a whole host of things where it's, hey, this is the way we've done things. Change is hard in any organization. So I think that's the other part we have to keep in mind. But from a use case perspective, I think these two are, are really powerful ones because, again, the data is there, the data is clean, the data is controlled, and we have a controlled environment in which we can apply some of this machine learning to try to identify some other ways of doing it that could be better or could be more efficient than before. Right. And I think you make a great point there, E, is that you know, we have really intelligent people and great operators working in these facilities that need to interpret the outputs from these tools and ensure that they're operationally feasible in nature, that we can't just take the output from the tool and implement it. We have to interpret the information that we receive from these, these tools. Yep. You know, and, and moving on into artificial intelligence, um, you know, AMRs have been in the space, and they were they were so hot in the past, you know, six to seven years. And I don't think you could you know, look at a project uh, six years ago without the AMR coming up. But but now we're hearing about you know autonomous forklifts, so they're continuing into that space. 
Um, another very interesting concept is the utilization of drones. Um, and um, one of the things that I talked about with uh, with one of my associates is utilizing drones within a warehouse to capture SKU data to gauge the fullness of a pallet and to determine based on certain thresholds when a, a warehouse worker needs to intervene. So the the, uh, the opportunity is great there to again minimize the number of touch points um, for warehouse associates and, and again optimize our workforce and ensure they're doing the important tasks uh, within a facility. And then, yeah. um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Ryan. No, you go. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I, I, I think those are some absolutely some, and I think it's the, you know, back to the first slides for the definition of artificial intelligence, which is, you know, a machine, right, doing what humans do. And I think that's exactly right, right, that you're pointing out some examples of where we're, we're truly seeing that, dare I say, air quotes, AI coming to the, the forefront, because for these AMRs, for these, these drones, you know, to, to be able to function amongst us humans in a safe and efficient way, there is a level of AI that has to be employed. And that's everything from you know, basic safety, like the LIDARs and 3D cameras to be able to identify obstacles and, and when to stop and when not to, but also the intelligence of being able to, you know, perform certain tasks within the warehouse. Right. No, and I think that just to kind of cap things off is that, uh, again, I pointed this out earlier that this technology allows us to look at the entire facility in, in total versus, you know, bits and pieces and sections, you know, inbound, storage, pick pack, ship, but the optimize the the, the warehouse in, in total, um, even looking at the the transportation that is coming in, the orders as they're going out, um, a wing to wing view um, is something that we've always aspired to in supply chain. But again, new tools give us the ability to aspire to to that uh, that wing to wing view. And I would say to follow on that to the Ryan, I, I think a lot of that notion of the, the last one, right? I think because that's the big one, optimizing the entire warehouse. I, I would say that this is for the audience, right? I, I would I would urge anyone who's who's if they or their bosses or their boss's bosses are saying, oh, let's let's leverage AI to do this. That's a good conversation to have. But I believe or I, I would suggest it's a conversation to have with folks like yourselves, Ryan, right, who've been in this space, who know it, because you have to be able to cut, I'm not going to say the full word, but cut the BS out of what the reality is. Because I do believe like some of what what we're, what you're saying is spot on, right? If you, on, on, on the surface, right? If I took a, um, a scientific approach to it, but of course, I have all the data sources. I have a lot, you know, labor management systems. I've got the WMSs, WCS, WES, the robotics, right? I've, I've got all this, these data pools and, and guess what? I should be able to use AI to then take all this data and to optimize across the entire warehouse. But I would caution that, you know, as, as, as the audience should go back and remember when I, when we define some of these things, right? It's theoretical optimization. And what, what we have to caution people is on a spreadsheet or in a lab, it might make great sense. And then you employ it in the real world and there are unintended consequences that happen. And let's face it, the reality, Ryan, right, is if I, it looks good and I'm like, oh, let's optimize the whole warehouse and I try to optimize it. And then all of a sudden I realize, well, you know what? I've optimized 85% of it, but I've not pushed a constraint somewhere within my warehouse I never expected. And now the knock-on effect is even worse than before. Yeah. Now what happens? And, and I don't mean to say that people shouldn't be thinking about this, but I, I would just say a, a word of caution where this is that last one in particular to me is, is I think where a lot of promises, but also a lot of unknowns are. And I think that's where you, you know, as, as a consumer of this, you have to be very um, structured, if you will, in terms of how you approach this and and be very structured or very uh honest with yourself with the risks associated with this because i think that's the part that's that i think is 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 not discussed enough i'll, I'll give you sort of a side side example you know we modex was just a few few weeks ago and i was talking to a, a friend of mine who um, works another company and he said someone came up to him a, a user and said oh you know i'm trying to I'm trying to fix my warehouse well what ai tool will you use for that and it's <laughs> like well wait, wait 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 a minute like 
you know, there's no magic wand here, right? This is not a uh, pixie dust. I'm going to spread it on the warehouse and all of a sudden all my ills are gone. And I think that's something where folks like yourselves, I think, have to be that sounding board, you know, for people. Because, again, it, I could see where this particular one around artificial intelligence can really take a life of its own and get people into more trouble than into benefit. Yep. And I couldn't agree with you more, Guy. Uh, our experience at SEDLAC is that each one of these um, engagements, uh, endeavors needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. And you have to look at the the future state scenario and compare it to current state and ensure that this is something that you really, really want to do. Because to your point, you made a great uh, point that, that there can be unintended consequences that you haven't factored in. So the final final one we want to talk touch on here is the use of autonomous vehicles. Um, so this is kind of an an interesting one. I would have said uh, five to six years ago that this would have uh, completely taken off um, at this point. That this would have been really integrated into society, integrated into logistics. Um, you know, I spent a significant amount of time in uh, third party logistics before I came to uh, to uh, consulting, and uh, there was talk of. Um, you know, driverless vehicles, and that was going to, you know, take over the long hauls. And it really hasn't taken off, um, mostly because of the the risk concerns that have come up. There have been some significant um, issues that have concer- uh, came up with a couple of providers, uh, more on the um, uh, ride share side, that has slowed things down. Um, but but ultimately, what uh, autonomous driving technology would allow for is you know, better, safer travel paths, avoiding traffic, avoiding weather. Uh, the, because there's no no human involvement, the, the vehicles could run 24-7. There would be the precise route planning. Um, you'd have, uh, of course, reduced labor costs and then ultimately enhanced safety. So some of that has played out, others haven't. Um, but this is one that, we, you know, we, we look at uh, kind of cautiously because of all of the buzz that's surrounded around it. Um, but also that um, you know, we want to continue to keep our eye on it because um, if those kinks can be worked out, there's tremendous value in this in this technology, both uh, you know commercially on the trucking side as well as you know on the rideshare side um, and the in t- the cab side of things. I agree 100%, and I and I'm I'm going to quote uh, uh, you know Bill Gates on this, right? I think a lot of times we we overestimate technology in the near term and underestimate it in the long term. And I think this is one of those cases. And part of it, I, I agree with you, Ryan, is that we're, you know, many of us probably do a lot of flying, uh, speak for myself, but, you know, you realize, uh, what, it's like 98% of the flight is done autonomously. Like the pilots right. are in there to some degree just to make, which what is, makes me feel comfortable that there's a human still in the cockpit. Um, but, you know, I, I, I go, you know, when you, if you ever go to Paris, the, the subway, a lot of the subways in Paris are autonomous. There's no driver in the cab. Uh, now, there is a central control system where there's someone monitoring, but at the end of the day, it's autonomous vehicle. Now, controlled environment, it's on rails, right? It knows which stations to go to. It, it will detect, obviously, if there's anything in its way, et cetera. So it is, in a way, a very rudimentary autonomous you know, vehicle. It's not like the trucks that we're seeing out in Nevada or something, which are literally driving from point A to point B on their own. But I do think it's one of those where, you know, when when I one of the things I saw many years ago, which is interesting, is say, you know, the notion of autonomous driving has been around for a while because let's all f- remember when cruise control came out, that was the beginning, right? You would just set your vehicle yep. at a certain speed. Uh, you take your foot off the accelerator and you still control the steering wheel, hopefully, but your car literally was for that part of the of the drive was on its own. So this notion of autonomous vehicles has to some degree been around longer than we have, you know, this notion of what we're seeing today, uh, it, it kind of like AI, right? AI has been around, like I said, almost 70 years. Uh, but I do think from a logistics perspective, you know, to your point, Ryan, where we can start leveraging this at a more... Uh, to scale level, I think one of the things, and again, this is futuristic, and I I don't think it's a use case that we need to worry about tomorrow, but something to think about. You know, think about this: if I've got, um, you know, a machine or we got AMRs picking in my warehouse, and I've got some autonomous uh, last mile delivery, 
rather than just the, the navigation, what about the communication between the two systems? So I know that if I'm picking this item and it has to go out at a certain time, you know, do I have available logistics that are going to be there? Today, what we do, right, is we basically like, well, FedEx, UPS, USPS, DHL are going to be at the, you know, the dock bay at this time. So I need to get this order ready by four o'clock for it to be out. But what if all of a sudden I could be much smarter with that and have some kind of on-call because of AI ability to marry the two? And I think those are some of the things on top of just being able to navigate the streets and navigate a route uh, safely and efficiently. I think it's that aspect of service, of efficiency that we as supply chain professionals need to think about is if I am have all this information in my warehouse that I can be very precise as to when I'm going to pick this order, can I also be more precise on the other end to say, when do I want that truck to pull out to my loading dock to pick up that order? And if I'm a 3PL or someone else, you know, maybe I start doing that where it, that becomes a premium product. Hey, you want this on demand? I can guarantee you, you know, a truck will be there within 45 minutes because I can pull the data from your systems to see when you're making the picks, but you pay me a premium for that. But then as the the brand or the, or the company, I'm like, well, hey, if I get that to the consumer two hours faster because they need it, Maybe I'll maybe I'll pay that premium. Yeah. That's yeah, there's so much opportunity here. And uh it just it just speaks to, you know, the the this the smart minds that, that we have um working in this space that they'll they'll work out the the kinks, um, the opportunity to work out the kinks, but they've got to they've got to overcome the risk aspect of this. Um because there is a tremendous amount of um, of risk profile here with these autonomous vehicles, so it just seems like um, we feel safer with a with a person behind the wheel, just to, in general. But uh, over time, I think that could that could fade. Which is it's kind of I don't want it's it, I I don't want to sound crude about it, but it's like yeah we we're, we're we feel more comfortable with that 19 year old behind the wheel who's <laughs> also on their phone texting and not paying attention to the road. As opposed to a machine, <laughs> right? That is yeah. that is just programmed to be safe, right? I, but hey, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Good technology, bad technology, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and then um, we'll just talk briefly here about uh, the characteristics of successful AI ventures. Um, you know, what some of the things that are really important to look at um, are how complex the operations are and how much improvement is needed. Um, so are you solving a clear identified problem? If, if the problem is very ambiguous, it may not make it as much sense. So intuitively, you know, does it make sense to use AI for this? Or, or again, you know, are you are you getting in pressure internally within your organization to use AI because it's a it's it's a hot topic and, uh, you know, others are using AI um, or is there um, a simpler solution for the problem yeah no uh, I, I, oh, I i was gonna say ryan i think that's the big one for me um yeah. as you go through these is is really to have that that identified use case because you know i think the examples you gave in the warehouse i think are, are ones for people to think about is those are very identifiable uh focused use cases that that are true issues of a bigger problem but I I think it's if it's back to the example I gave of, hey, I've got like a skew problem, solve it for me. OK, wait a minute. Like, you know, there's world hunger out there. Just put AI and solve that. That's the same level, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I agree. And um, and I think um, the next bullet is one of the important ones. You know, it has an ROI been identified uh, for the project to compare to the AI investment. I know in uh, at Sedlac, and um, our engagements on the design side, we always identify an ROI for, you know, a, a piece of automation, and it's so important to understand if you're gonna if you're gonna put um, an investment into into a project, into an initiative, into a piece of equipment, you have to understand what is the return on investment um, on that on that piece of equipment, and um, you know. Quality data and forecasts, you know, Guy, you, you talked about this pretty significantly um, during your presentation on the overview. Um, and we've said this for long, uh, a long time, and I've been in supply chain, garbage in, garbage out. 
we don't have quality data, it's very difficult to assess um, the uh, the quality of a AI investment. Um, and if you use high level data, then you know the 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 bands of um, of the um, the costs are going to be very loose. So the better data that you have, um, the better off your solution is going to be. Uh, there are ethical impl implications as well. Have you considered those? Um, uh, that's uh, that's that's very touchy. Yeah, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all. Yeah, I, I think that's we could do a whole PhD dissertation on this one. Um, but I do think Ryan, it's it's a good one to bring up because I, I you know, you, in your last bullet point, you talk about quality data and forecasting, and 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 then if we really peel that onion back, which goes into ethical stuff, is what about if it's consumer data? What if about if it's like if you're in the healthcare industry, right? What if it's some health data? Um, what does that look like ethically? And I think the other part of ethical implications to think about, and again, we could spend a whole host time on this, is that there is an ESG component to this, right? So for for folks who, who hopefully you've heard ESG, but ESG is is really around sustainability, right? It's it's an it's environmental sustainability and governments governance as the term. And when you think about using AI, AI does do what? I, as I mentioned earlier, right? It's a lot about computation power, a lot about data extraction. All that takes electricity. All that takes things like water for cooling. So there is a, 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 an, a implications around using this tool because it's not free of charge, so to speak. So yes, you can go on a chat GTP and I will freely admit I've done this and say, hey, uh, who are the the 10 best soccer players ever to play? And it runs something and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I disagree that I'm going to run it again. As I've been studying this more, I'm, I'm starting to realize like, wait a minute, like did I just burn, you know, how much CO2 did I burn for some silly question like that? Um, and I think, yeah, there's some ethical implications when it comes to this that it, it doesn't mean you need to not look at AI, but just to your point, Ryan, it has to be something that we need to think about and just like we do today, like when, you know, whenever I travel and you go on and you book your, your plane ticket, there is a CO2 component that comes up. I will be honest, like I, it doesn't, I don't truly understand the, what, what it means. Like I know it's a lot, but I think we're starting to see more of this movement. And I think that's very important because again, um, you know, I'll give you sort of a, a side story related to this. You know, when we think about how much data, how much, how much computation power we're doing to do so many things, Think about blockchain, right? The, the last big hot topic before all this was blockchain and uh, things like, you know, Bitcoin. I have a friend of mine whose son decided to be a Bitcoin miner. So he, he wired up like four uh, Xboxes together to do Bitcoin mining for a month. And after the month was over, he was so excited because he went to his dad and he said, dad, I, I mined like 107 bucks of Bitcoin. And his dad said, that's great, son, but you cost me like $500 worth of electricity bills during that month because of you pulling that much power. Right, so it's just a story to show that there are ethical and other implications when it comes to using some of these tools. And I, my ask of the audience is just is just be aware of it, right? And we don't know necessarily what all those are, but I think being aware and being able to process that I think is is an important aspect when it comes to diving into AI. Yeah, and Guy, what uh, on that? Uh... Last bullet, the change management impact being identified. I think that's it's really important that um, you know it's communicated to the organization um, that you're making a change, considering using AI versus the current process. Um, I just want you to discuss a little bit about maybe what you've seen with that being done effectively. Some some you know potential situations where it maybe hasn't been done effectively, and and some best practices there. Yeah, and that's that's also one we could spend uh, uh, plenty of time on. But it, it, like every every technology or every tool that we start putting into place, there is going to be change management. And and what do we mean by that, Ryan? Right, is the is the notion that you know your your process, your governance within the four walls of your warehouse or within your supply chain, within your business, things are going to change. Like rules are going to change, work is going to change, responsibilities are going to change, the way we do certain things. And what is that? long-term or near-term knock-on effect from that change management. So for example, and, and this is maybe more, you know, uh, a process change, but I certainly seen, if we go back to your example of AMRs using AI in the warehouse, and, you know, we've seen plenty of examples of warehouses get very excited because, oh, we're, we're putting AMRs in to solve for picking. Fantastic. 
They put the where the the robots in. Their picking goes through the roof, but all of a sudden now the process flow has changed. Where at takeaway, there's a big backup. So now you're picking so quickly, your takeaway you cannot process those those picks or those those orders fast enough. Maybe at at uh, induct you don't have enough totes because you've been picking so efficiently that the totes are backlogged at takeaway and they're not getting back to induct. So the change management around that is all of a sudden now your labor is you know sort of frustrated because they're like, well, wait a minute, things seem to be going fine before. Yeah, we could be a little bit more efficient, but now you know I was brought in to do X and now I'm doing Y and I don't understand what's going on. So there's things like that. There's also things change management when you introduce something like AI. Now, AI is a little different because it's not necessarily visible, but if you introduce something like a robot into a warehouse, there's change management from the standpoint of people look at it and are like, am I gonna lose my job? Is this taking my labor away, right? So how do you, how do you ensure that organizationally you maintain a good work environment regardless of what tools you put in? And again, with AI, I think sometimes what happens is we're gonna optimize or solve for one problem without realizing it's just moving constraints somewhere else. And therefore, right. how do we as an or how do you as an organization ensure that you're flexible enough to adapt to that? And and part of it, and I think Ryan, this is the part that is 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 hard. It's really hard. Is a lot of times the change management we don't know until it happens, right? We might think that okay, we're going to do this, and the process is going to change this way, and that people are going to have to adapt that way. And all of a sudden, we put stuff in and realize, oh. That was wrong too, and it's changed this other way now. So I, I think the the word or the advice I would give to folks too is, again, working with folks like you guys, Ryan, is to to think through these and but to realize that you're most likely not going to identify exactly the change aspects that are going to happen, but be prepared, be flexible to know that it's going to happen, and then how do you react to it? And I think the exercise of of trying to think about this before you start implementing or diving into AI is also a very necessary exercise because then you start thinking about different scenarios that might change within your 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 job, your function, your business, and then how does that have a bigger impact in your organization? I think those are the parts that I think people need to, you know, need to really give spend time to think about and to process with the understanding in mind. You're not necessarily going to identify each one that's going to happen. But to be flexible with it. Yeah. Oh, great point, Guy. And um, I'm going to use that to to springboard into um, some of the questions that we've gotten from the audience. So um, just want to thank uh, the audience for their questions. Uh, one of the first ones we got um, is how do we uh, apply guardrails to challenge AI data, and how do we find bad data? That is also a, uh, a a PhD dissertation on. Um, I, I think it's it's it starts with your data governance, and and this starts with, I would say your IT organization. I say this, you wouldn't start higher, meaning at the top of the C suite to be able to say this is how, you know, we're going to have a data governance. How are we going to uh, ingest data? Uh, what are the tools we need to have to clean that data, to ingest it, to store it, to keep it uh, up to date? Uh, I think that's the first place to start, Ryan. I think the second part is because, again, you know, part of this is data is coming into us, obviously, fast and furious. It's coming to us all the time, um, is to have a, I would say, sort of a cautious skepticism of some of the data that comes in. And again, use that supercomputer between your ears, right? If the data is telling you something, but you feel it's something different, challenge the data. Uh, there's a great uh, quote from Jeff Bezos who said, you know, if there's data and anecdotes, I believe the anecdotes. You know, the story goes that uh, supposedly the data from Amazon said that their customer care line, this is back when you would call a number, you know, you'd be waiting for like two minutes. And that was that was a data, data said that. The data looked clean and it said that. And Bezos said, and I've heard different. And a famous story, he was literally sitting in one of his leadership meetings and his head of customer care said this. And he said, all right, took the phone called customer care and they all sat there looking at holds for like 15, 20, 30 minutes. So the reason I bring this up is, is again, use what's between your ears, trust your instincts. Don't be afraid to challenge the data. And the question, there's no silver bullet, right? It, it's it's one of those where I wish I could say, hey, just do X, Y, and Z and you'll guarantee to have a, a clean source of data, but that's not the case. And I think the other part too, Ryan, is sometimes is, 
is be open to pulling in other sources of data. What I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of companies out there too that will provide different sources of data that you could pull from. Maybe you start looking at those and have sort of a, a flexible ability to, to look at different data because maybe it's going to tell you something a little different and therefore make you think a little differently and hopefully come up with a better decision. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, speaking of thinking differently, I got a suggestion in the chat to start entering my scorecard information then I can draw a more accurate ball loss quantity. So this is uh, <laughs> this is the kind of AI I like to think about. So thank you for that suggestion. Um, the same person uh, has a good sense of humor. Thank you. Uh, they also asked, um, Guy, are data transmission set up with Texas and automation vendors to take order path data and predict the most optimal path within a wave release or an emergency release order? Uh, those with or without zone constraints or time in system estimates? Uh, that's great. Great technical question. So I'm going to answer uh, yes with a caveat, which is the following. Hypothetically, I mean, yes, we, you know, companies like Texas, we do this all the time. We will pull data and we'll look at different ways of picking whether it's a zone or, or how you're doing it and what kind of automation that you're employing. So absolutely, we could certainly uh work on that but what i would say is the following right it's it depends on what the system what i mean by this is okay what's the warehouse look like how many zones what's the SKU level what are you picking what kind of automation and you have to ingest all that data from those different sources and this goes back to this notion of you know what are those sources uh are they are the data exchanges in a way that's clean with whether it's a texas system or any other system of record and I think that's what you have to look at, right? How is the plumbing being done behind the scene? And then how can you employ or uh, you know deploy some of these AI tools uh, to be smarter about it? So, you know, I sound like a broken record, and but I think at the end of the day is a lot of these promises are great, but let's go back to the fundamentals to make sure that what's coming in, that the data pipe is clean and it's done in a way that I can ingest it properly because there are nuances. And I'll, I'll give you sort of another, another sort of anecdote on this, Ryan. So I worked a long time ago for a company where we processed point of sale data and we yeah. had a very large uh, retailer, top five retailer, a uh, large uh, drugstore, I won't name them, but they're out of Rhode Island. And uh, they would literally send us data in unstructured CSV files. So the reason I bring it up is that you have to get to that level to to understand the data and to trust it. And you know, companies like ours, one of the things that we are are adamant about is how do we ensure that what we're pulling in is the data that we need, that it's clean, that's reliable, that's up to date. And that's up to us to work with our customers to figure out where those data sources are and how then we can process it and then apply things like AI to do things like better routing, better slotting, et cetera. That's great. Thanks, Guy. Uh, um, someone wants to know how they can learn more about LLMs and um, a suggestion was to get comfortable with chat GT, GPT first. Um, would you suggest anything different? No, I think that's good. I, 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 I would say this too, right? I, I think LLMs sort of carry this aura about them which at the end of the day is it's you know it's a large language model which means to some degree it's just a massive data set of stuff you can call upon so yeah chat gpt if you look there's a there's a uh, another one out there called grammarly which is basically sort of a, a spell checker on steroids uh it's got a, a little bit of chat gpt in it but it's also a lot of uh you know checking your syntax checking your spelling it, it does do some recommendations right these are the type of tools i would say to get used to this type of engine because what it's going to what it does is it gets you comfortable with how to ask it questions. Now, I, again, if you want to get into the technical and the scientific part, that's a whole different can of worms. But in terms of how to use it, it shows you or it it gives you an intro into how to ask questions, how to feed things into it to then get something out of it. What I would caution people about, though, is that you know people you put stuff into things like ChatGPT. Well, they're in there. And guess what that means? That data is being stored somewhere so someone else could get access to it. So I would caution, and I know some people have said this, well, we'll just put, you know, like our latest financial models in there and have it, you know, run something for us. Okay, go ahead. Recognize the risk. Recognize, as you pointed out before, Ryan, sort of the ethical aspect of it, which is what I tell my kid all the time, the internet never forgets and chat GPT certainly never forgets, which means 
whatever you share, assume you're sharing it and it's being ingested and it's being leveraged for other things uh, that you might not have control over. But it is a good way uh, to get used to it. I would also caution, and again, this is back to the ethical side, uh, you are also burning a lot of CPU, yep. you're burning a lot of energy. Uh, if you look, and there's some really interesting studies out there uh, to train a smaller large language model uh, out there, it takes the same amount of carbon as to drive from Earth to the moon. I know we just had an eclipse, so it's all on top of our mind, but that's a lot of carbon. Uh, and there's some interesting studies out there about that. So again, I'm not saying don't do it, but just be aware of that. Uh, Guy, uh, another question uh, you were discussing during your presentation, storage and retrieval, picking AI applications for warehouse automation. Uh, one of the uh, users wanted to know um, what you foresee for the second half, you know, for order of throughput, packing, finishing, and the shipping side of, um, you know, from an AI perspective. It was more along the lines of AMRs or uh, if you want to touch on anything specific there. No, I think it's, I, I, I touched upon a little bit, I think, Ryan, I think it's a good question about, you know, where do we start seeing more of these applications? And, and I would say sort of very simplistic, I don't want to say simplistically, I mean, it's the wrong term, but I think one that I, I, I do get excited about is, as you had talked about earlier too, the, the beauty potentially of AI being able to harness a lot of this different data is how do we get more orchestration, true orchestration between everything from inside the warehouse to the dock door, through delivery, through returns, right? So almost if we take the score model and we start bunching pieces of it together a little tighter. So as the question said, right, how do we see sort of that, that back end happen? What I see is a little bit more orchestration, meaning, hey, I know that I'm actually picking at, you know, 227. Uh, that order for Ryan is literally being picked by this robot in aisle seven. And I know that, you know, based on what else is being picked and then what other robots or people or items are in the aisles, it should get to take away by 317. And then I know that Mary's there and she's pretty good because based on the data, I know that she can you know, put stuff back into a box uh, within six minutes. So I can start being a lot smarter about how do I orchestrate that back end? So instead of potentially, you know, either waiting for a truck to show up and then filling the whole truck before it leaves, could I potentially yep. dispatch smaller trucks? Could I dispatch more couriers? Could I do a whole host of things? Could I potentially even, you know, that pick is supposed to happen right now, but I know it's not going to get out for another six hours. So I'm going to put that pick at the back of the line and prioritize other picks. So I think we we have, there's the promise, Ryan, if we start using some of these analytical tools to look at different data sources, whether it's at the pick face, at the pick, at what's coming in, at trucks that are coming in, at the fulfillment, to be a little bit more orchestrated, if you will. Now, I still think there's a, there's a whole, that's a lot of theory. I think in practice, you know, let's nibble at the edges before we start really diving in and trying to change a lot of the processes. But I do think there's a lot of promise from that perspective. No, couldn't agree more. And, and, and um, you know, can you just kind of uh, wrap things up? And, um, you know, the, the final question is, you know, how, how do users, uh, you know, ask those hard questions about uh, the need for AI? Is it real? Or are they getting swept up in the hype? I mean, you, every time I turn on the TV talking about AI, this <laughs> this new company, this new stock, how, how do we, how do they ask the questions? How do we help them, you know, not get uh, swept up in in the hype and and make the right decisions for their business? Oh yeah, that that's uh, another good one. I mean, I'll I'll give a side first story about this uh, about the hype. I was on LinkedIn the other day, and then you know sometimes it pops up on the right, like people you should you should connect to. And and there was a person that was running a, uh, I believe it was a, uh, which was great. It was a a dog rescue organization, and it was basically you know dog matching powered by AI. And I I was like, oh my goodness, like this is how we this is how far this has gone. Like now, I got to put AI in everything. Like <laughs> it, you know, I'm like, come on. But to your point, Ryan, I I look at two I look at sort of two buckets. The first bucket is, and I'm going to speak here to you know the the AI providers, the vendors, software players, hardware players, all this. I caution this this side of the house to say, you know, don't just don't just willy nilly say AI this, AI that, generative AI, deep machine learning. 
Um, I caution us because what it does is it paints this picture that AI is a sol- it, it, it's it's pan- you know it's a panacea. It's going to solve everything. Just because a CEO stands up on stage and says, "Oh, we're doing all this generative AI," you know, be careful of that. You know, when I was an industry analyst long t- not that long ago, but I remember cloud was the biggest thing, and everybody that would come brief me, the first thing they told me, Ryan, was, "Oh, we're cloud," and I'd be like, "Well, why?" And then these these looks on their faces were like, "Well, aren't we supposed to be?" And I'm like, "I don't know. You tell me. Like, why are you in the cloud?" Same thing with AI. Now, from the user side, I think absolutely. First and foremost ask the hard questions. What I mean by that is simple questions like, hey, is AI, why am I using AI for this? What does that mean? How, you know, wh- why is this better than doing what X, Y, and Z is doing? Um, I think the other part for users is quite honestly, don't let, and I will put myself in this category, but don't let us tech nerds try to sort of browbeat you into saying, oh yeah, yeah, you've got to be on AI. And, and it's and, and if you're like, wait, I'm confused by this, don't let us try to be smarter than you think we are, because trust me, we're not. Be be curious, be skeptical, push the 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 companies that are promoting this to understand exactly. Okay, well, how is how is this being employed? What does this look like? What does the engine look like? What kind of AI are you putting in? What about your data strategy? How are you going to get the data from me? How are you going to use the data? How are you going to store the data? What if the data is not clean? What are the data sources you have to make this even more powerful? And one of the great points you made, Ryan, is, okay, what is the use case you're solving for me? And this is the part two I would tell users is don't be afraid to push it down as far down the stack if you want, hypothetical, meaning like don't just say, well, optimize my warehouse. Okay, well, what part of my warehouse? My picking, my put away, my cycle count, what is it? Oh, okay, it's my picking. Well, what kind of picking? Is it my each's picking? Is it my pallet picking? Is it aisle seven through nine that we're going to look at? I think that's the part ride for users to really be, be, be pushy, be right. Ask the hard questions. And there are no, honestly, there are no dumb questions because anybody who tells you myself included, and I'm certainly not that they're an AI expert, they're full of it. Now, yes, if you go to MIT or Caltech or Georgia tech, you've got folks that are super smart studying this. But what I mean to say is, is, is in, in half joking is, you know, a lot of the solution providers you're going to talk to, especially if it's the salespeople, they like push the question, push the question, get answers that you feel comfortable with and realize that there are no stupid questions that A, yes, AI is already in a lot of things we do. But if if someone comes to you and it's it sounds too good to be true, the, as the old saying says, it probably is. And a lot of it with AI is this, oh, well, we're doing a generative AI, so it's going to be great. Okay, well, how, why, why is it better than before? What is it doing that's different? You know, what are the repercussions? What are the unintended consequences that might come out of this? Um, maybe, you know, you're using AI to get me a 2% improvement, but it's costing me 5%. Well, that's not good. So I would say, Ryan, my last sort of lesson on this for every for the users is, you know, ask the questions, ask the questions, ask the questions, ask the questions until you feel comfortable. And don't let, again, folks like myself who who are in this technology to make you feel like because you don't understand it, that you should you're going to have FOMO. Now, ask the questions. Yeah, FOMO is a, is a big concern. It's got to be right uh, for your business. That's what that's what we see at SEDLAC is uh, everything is on a case by case basis. And, um, you know, I also want to just say we've got the, the finishing slide here that, uh, you know, myself and Guy, we're, we're here as resources. Um, yep. Our contact information is there. Please reach out if we just want to uh, use this as a sounding board. We're available, uh, bounce things off of us. So, um, you know, that that concludes our uh, our virtual event. I would like to uh, extend my thanks to to Guy for his uh, his presentation and his uh, the sharing of his knowledge during our uh, d- discussion tracks and the Q and A. So thank you, Guy. Great job. Thanks, Ryan, and and uh, thanks to you and Lou and the rest of the team for having me on. And thanks for everybody who was on this. Um, again, a, a really great topic, one that will certainly not go away. One that's very relevant, but again, uh, ask the hard questions. Yep. Thanks for the audience involvement and appreciate your questions. And uh, again, if we can be of any assistance, please reach out. So uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.